attention. Attention, please wait up at the back. I have a special announcement to make. The ESIN party, time and place, have been mutated to the ballet room downstairs at 1 o'clock Eastern Time. Please take note, message ends, panel begins. Correction, malfunction of sensors, we are on central time. <laughs> I don't know whether that's right, but that's the sort of feeling I get. 
I think the, the problem has been this. Over the last few years, the BBC has progressively been taken over by the incumbents. Um, program making has no longer been at the centre of the BBC's policy. Uh, in fact, uh, there was an occasion when some uh, architects were being shown around television centre, and they were seriously, seriously planning to redevelop some of the studios into office space. Now, and that's a commitment from a broadcasting organisation, once one of the world leaders. Uh, so that's very, very bad news indeed. But the, the whole fabric of British broadcasting has changed virtually overnight. So much more is being done by independents. There's so much more satellite stuff being done, cables coming into the frame. Um, it, it, it is a renaissance of television. And the BBC is no longer the, the, the sort of the holder together, the yardstick of, of, of British broadcasting as once it was. And I think the quality, therefore, the quality of the programmes that the BBC do now aren't as good. I mean, I've seen some things recently that the BBC probably wouldn't have touched, you know, a few years ago because of the quality, because it's all going out to other people. We have a lot of repeats now as well. Yes, we do. New programmes just aren't being... You've even seen hanging out with Mr. Coop. <laughs> I have. What's that? <laughs> about the different styles of working with uh, John Pertwee and Tom Baker. If Wendy could tell us some of uh, what it was like to work with uh, Pat Troughton and Fraser and Hines, and uh, John Leeson, uh, some of the trials and tribulations of being- Working with this lady. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'll start then. Um, working with John was very different from working with Tom. And that was my good fortune because it allowed my character to change, to, to grow. John's doctor was sort of the dandy, it was the gentleman doctor. It was literally a figuratively cloak, you know, rather than a little chip to protect them. He was a very protective doctor, I felt. Um, with Tom, it was much more a case of, you know, telling someone to go out and do it themselves. Like, what, what, oh, yes, well, go on. He, 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 he was not afraid, actually, his doctor to be a cervic to actually lose his temper. I think it's wonderful when people are allowed to, to lose their temper on screen. It happens. It happens in real life, but you know, it doesn't often get shown, maybe in a program like Doctor Who. And it was wonderful when Tom lost his temper, because he lost it for the right reasons, that he was concentrating on saving the universe. You know, and I was you, I was the audience, asking all the questions that had to be asked. And if, you know, you've got a brain surgeon or someone with two hearts saving the universe, you know, you're going to get quite touchy when someone says, what's that thing for? What's that switch? But that's you and me asking him the questions. It was very different. Um, also, I think by the time I was working with Tom, I was I was um, I was very strongly comfort comfortable in what I thought Sarah should be and should do. And uh, I hope by having you know two doctors and staying in for three seasons, she she grew and she progressed. Right. Patrick and Fraser, what can I say? <laughs> Actually, um, working with Patrick um, was just something else again because I, when I was a little girl, he was always, always my favourite actor. He used to do, um, the BBC used to do Sunday afternoon classics um, or the Dickens and all those sort of things, and Pat was nearly always in those. He was just wonderful, so of course, when I knew I was going to be working with him, oh, um, it was amazing. And I, I suppose I learned everything I know from Pat because I was young. I hadn't done an awful lot of work before. And apart from the fact that we had great fun, I did learn an enormous amount from him. He was a very private person, very private person then. And um, I learned, I suppose, that's why I always thought, why sometimes it's difficult to remember things because we didn't comprehend then how big Doctor Who was going to be. And it was just like a job. I mean, it was a job. We used to go to work, and Patrick always taught me that you go to work, you do your job to the best of your ability, and then you go home, and whatever happens afterwards is your private life. So it, it was very difficult for me to, to comprehend conventions, for instance. I know Pat got involved with conventions eventually, because he phoned me up and he said, 
you'll never get spoiled. I said, what? He said, I've been to a convention. I said, you haven't. And he said, and you'll never guess what else. And I said, what? He said, I loved it. <laughs> so I did always say that, he said, will you come on here? And I said, yes, I would love to come. And sadly, that wasn't to be to come with them, to come with Pat. Um, but the fun we had, of course, working with, with Fraser, um, it was just phenomenal. I mean, it was great, great fun. They were terrible practical jokers. They did hideous things. And um, we just had a brilliant time. It was a wonderful job, actually. It was a really wonderful job to do. And, and wonderful for a young actress you know, to get that opportunity. And also to work with all the other actors in Doctor Who, because they were the quality of the actors in Doctor Who. Every really good actor in England has been in Doctor Who, and they wanted to be in it which was, again, wonderful for a young actress. So I had a ball, absolute ball. As far as Tom Baker's concerned, I mean, let's face it, chalk and cheese, chalk and cheese, but one of the most exciting actors I've ever worked with. So, one of the most energized, um, and one of the most, also, one of the most unpredictable, which is a wonderful quality for somebody who's going to play a time ball. Because um, one doesn't know in which era he's living in, that particular time. Um, he had the ability to look at scripts and things like that and say, right, this is what this needs, that is what this needs, we need to blow air into it, we need to make it live, we need to make it vibe, we need to make it. to really open the whole thing out. Some of his sort of, how shall I say, uh, he, he would never go to the, the simple solutions either, which was very, very good. And this dreadful concept of the sonic screwdriver that the writers introduced, uh, which would theoretically get you out of any corner that then he boxed himself into. A real cop out! And Tom hated that. Um, he really did. He, he wanted to get some, some inventive ideas around the place. But his lateral thinking, Tom, you know, was a wonderful occasion when Tom. Uh, we, we, we do, I forget what the story was, but the, the hostiles were coming down one corridor, the standard BBC corridor. <laughs> <laughs> then it was relit, so it became another standard BBC <laughs> corridor. <laughs> and the, the slithering students were coming down that corridor. And he and Romana or Lido or whoever uh, were in the middle, and this sort of cliffhanger situation was, was building up, and Tom would say, well, you know what I think? I think there are only two ways out of this. Lateral <laughs> 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 thing, you know. <laughs> he knows more than we do. No, it was, it was a great treat to work with Tom, a real treat to work with Because, think about it, they say never work with children or animals, and when you've got a rather sort of immobile tin dog, his ears are switched off, aren't they? Um, I mean, it could have been a, a case of Tom being upstaged. We uh, worked uh, extremely well, I think, to say. I don't have a favourite actor. I, I just love being excited when I go to the theatre, for instance. 
because I like seeing the same actor play a lot of different roles and being really versatile and really good. I've just seen a production, funny enough, of Diana Rigg, who was in The Avengers, in a play called The Day. And she, I saw the play twice, once in a, a small theatre called The Almeida, um, where she, was, she won an award for her performance. She was just magnificent, and my heart bled for this woman at the end of the play. I then went to see it again in a bigger theatre, and I hated it. I didn't hate her. I hated the character. I felt completely differently about the play than I did the first time I saw it, and that's what I think is, makes a really fine actor. But I don't, also, I don't have a particular favourite. It's, it's very difficult. The actor's, the actor's job is basically to connect what is in here through the processes of the intellect and all the rest of the projection to what the audience feels in there. And there are so many, many good actors that I admire. Some are not what you might call showmen at all. They're, a lot of actors are very shy creatures, um, and their experience is often very deep indeed, and the performances that result there from uh, are extremely extreme integrity of great work. One gets the impression that the BBC is an organization unlike many others. <laughs> BBC stories not necessarily connected with Doctor Who. <laughs> Um, I have a story of the, at the time when I was out of work as an actor. I was up in Manchester in the north of England because a friend of mine had taken pity on me and had given me some work doing television and radio continuity, which I probably don't have too much of here, but we certainly do at home. Announcements into programmes and things like that, not necessarily off camera. Usually sometimes. But what happened was that I was, I had to learn this enormous great bank of, of switches and levers and this, that, and the other, that I could opt out one half of Britain and opt in another half of Britain. I was doing my own vision mixing, as well as announcing, as well as watching the clock, as well as having to get into the main network being radiated from London. Um, it was, it, oh dear me, hard work. And also, half past nine, the duty office, the, the place where they sent him all the complaints calls, went home, and all the complaints calls came from the office. And um, I went it was amazing because I was so new at this. And when the first call came through and said, Hello, are you the BBC? <laughs> Me! <laughs> what a responsibility! <laughs> but um, they had, it was very strange, because the BBC had a, a certain sort of civil service approach to, to, to things. And you had to log everything, had to write everything down in different books, all the complaints books and things. Procedures were very, very set. And the call came through uh, in, the, in the background very little rowdy singing and dancing and all those what noise and crazy sort of uh, inebriation going on. This chap said, I was like, oh, sorry, I've uh, got, got, got a question. I've got a question. Is this, is this from Handel's Messiah? Da, 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 da. So I said, well, to the best of my knowledge, no, it isn't. It's the trumpet voluntary by a composer called Jeremiah Clark. Oh, glory to God, that all, all works for that effect. So, <laughs> the phone, so I got made a friend. But I wrote it all down in the book. Well, uh, just about to go, half past 11, this chap, well, I can not jump to the moon, he can 
the nearest I got was Downing Street um, when we went and put my doctor who did to perform for some underprivileged children. I, I've sat with, in front of, right in front of Prince Charles. <laughs> and at the same time, <laughs> oh no, <laughs> um, I went to the club, I think it must have been the first night of the play I went to, and he just came in behind me and sat behind me. I spoke was like this. <laughs> well, I, I didn't actually get him. Lots of liberty to speak about the world, don't they? Get known down there. It's Go amazing though. The latest thing is the, the photos of Diana, Princess Diana, in, in the gym. Have you had that story? <laughs> that is amazing. And I listened to a phone in the next day on the radio and the the emotion that it, it you know that people were so irate that she'd some people anyway, was so irate that she'd been photographed when she was supposedly in a private place, a private gym. And other people thought she deserves everything she gets because she is a member of the royal family and therefore, She's if she goes to it, yes, yep. absolutely. Yep. Um, yeah, I just found the whole thing amazing. It's a circus. <laughs> yes. Uh, this is for Liz. Uh, with all the popularity of Doing, doctor. We 
have to be social, because when you get on that studio floor, you're the last person to be considered. So if the special effects don't work, you've got no chance. You've got no Absolutely. Yes. And time is key. The clock is ticking away. People's money, you know, going what? through overtime, not allowed. The 240 years with the cans on the floor. He was on there, because it's fine, it's lovely, it's not like, Get her to do that now, will you? <laughs> <laughs> Well, darling, could you move to the right? And then they're actually saying, Get her over there! <laughs> Drag her over! I was always terribly embarrassed whenever K9 stalled and sort of kick up over a match stick. They had to shoot. I did! I felt terribly responsible. <laughs> <laughs> In rehearsals, I got it right. <laughs> Sitting on a shelf, or a bug 
But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's sometimes, I'll tell you something I do. Um, if ever I'm in a closed studio and there isn't a glass between the technician, the sound technicians and me, they can't see me warming up sitting down with my script. And they'll say, right, John, um, come in, a uh, bit, bit of level, the sound level. Yes, uh, okay, uh, one, two, three, more minutes. Yeah.
Tom had got his times in his famous coat, tucked away. <laughs> and uh, they'd, uh, they'd had a break down there, you know, they'd said, OK, take five, we've got to set up another shot. It be a canvas, or is, is it a, an anagram, or a... So, so we had this, we were just working on crossword for a little bit. Now, what I didn't know, and what, of course, I couldn't have seen, was that all around the, the filming location, all the locals had come to watch <laughs> the filming going on. And they had the unexpected sight of seeing Tom Baker sitting on the grass, K9 sitting beside him. <laughs>
Yes, I did used to get frustrated. I'm sure that the writers got frustrated as well. How can we use this girl again, you know, and, and make it different? Um, I used to find that the more, it, it depended, but if you put forward suggestions, I didn't feel the companion was as, listened to as much as the doctor. Maybe his ideas were better, but I, I think it's lovely actually to meet all the companions again, because we've all been through it, we've all had the same thing. I got to the point where um, I just used to do what I wanted to do. I didn't used to ask anyone anymore. It was much simpler. Time was short anyway. I knew if it wasn't working with Tom, we'd sort it out ourselves. But, but I'd always worked in a, in a system before where you put yourself, you know, you worked and you did it and you discussed it. And I did used to find sometimes on Doctor Who that, I mean, I remember by someone once being, I was actually moved like a robot on when I come on, you know, I can hear, I can speak, you know, but, but maybe that was me just being particularly sensitive at that point. But I just got to the stage where I just thought, right, this is what I'm going to do. If you don't like it, you tell me. And, and time and again, you, you know, I just used to do little things and get on with it. I didn't have any problems. <laughs> <laughs> I think they were very lucky with all the girls. I have to say, I said it to Wendy before, I saw on television, it must have been recently, recently, but I don't know when, Wendy's Zoe, in, in your sparkly suit. Oh, yes. <laughs>
obviously a desperate need. And why the girl? We, we just would sit there saying, well, well, we ought to do something. You know, people would hit you over the heads, their programs. <laughs> Suddenly, it's not like John Lee said has a 